want to talk to you today about the enemy's only hope to stop you. <laughs> I, I thought we were going to move into the next section of the articles portion of the website, but I feel like the Lord wants me to do at least this one more lesson concerning your enemy's only hope. Do you know he's been defeated? <laughs> Hey, there's news for the church <laughs> news for you the enemy has already been defeated he's really under our feet and I know you've heard that and I've heard that from so many preachers over these years and and uh, yeah we yes <laughs> but then in real life you know <laughs> we're battling sickness or wayward children or or we just got laid off at our job or the economy's bad or an election didn't go our way <laughs> or whatever and uh, <laughs> sometimes it sure doesn't seem like the enemy's under our feet like he's already been defeated but see we're not going to change the word of God he has been defeated Jesus completely disarmed him made a public spectacle of him made a show of him openly so what's what's going on here and so the last session or so, we I, I was talking about the Serving Son. I have a complete six-part series at the website titled The Serving Son. I really recommend you hear all six of those. But I was summarizing a little bit. And so let me summarize again today. And, and I, the title of today's message is Your Enemy's Only Hope. We keep thinking, like, what's our only hope? <laughs> It always seems to us like we're on, you know, almost the losing end of this battle, this constant war. But the truth is exactly the opposite. And uh, I think you'll see it easily today. Okay, let me let me summarize the, the serving son. And really, this is the the summary in a way of the entire lesson from Luke 15, 1 through Luke 17, 10. You, you know, the pro, everyone knows the story of the prodigal son. Well, how, how that whole section starts is Jesus is out amongst the sinners and the religious people couldn't understand why. To them, those sinners had no value at all. And I've already taught on this. Jesus, he starts teaching them. If you had, listen, if you had a lost sheep, you'd go looking for it. Why? It had value to you. If you lost a coin, you'd go looking for it. Why? It has value to you. And he's trying to get them to understand that these sinners have intense value to the Father. And that's why he's out amongst the sinners to seek and to save that which is lost. So in the he gives them example after example, teaching after teaching along this line. And uh, especially in the story of the, what we call the prodigal son, and you know the prodigal, he got his inheritance, he went into the world, he squandered it on sin, living a, a sinful life. And just like sin does to you, it brings it brought him so low, he eventually was so hungry that he was, uh, he was right at the point of putting his face into the pig trough and eating with the pigs. Well, it, it doesn't get much lower for a Jewish boy than that. <laughs> That's a, you know, it's a, it's a real picture of how well, you know what sin will do to you it'll just destroy your life but eventually he came to himself and he returned to his father's house and the father was overjoyed that his son who was lost had been found he even said my son who was dead and is alive again it's a picture of the new birth coming home but there was an elder son and this is a type of the religious crowd in that time the pharisees and the scribes but religion today which is really only interested in, it, in its best life now and using religion, to be honest with you, uh, to do well in life. I don't know how else to put it. You remember that rich man who kept stepping over Lazarus and wouldn't even give him the crumbs that came from his table? The Pharisees knew that Jesus was talking about them. That Lazarus is a type of the sinner, brought low, you know, and the, the Pharisees and scribes, they didn't care about the sinner at all. And they, they were concerned about their wealth and, you know, religious things, you know, like uh, washing of cups and hands and that type of thing. But they didn't, they didn't really understand God's heart. 
Well, that's the elder son. He didn't understand the father's heart at all. He, he thought the father should be mad at that sinner and, and condemn him and disown him. And, and why was that? Well, because he never spent any time with the father. <laughs> Let's say it this way. The love that was in the father for the prodigal, that love was not in the elder son. Why not? The elder son never spent any time with his father. If he had spent time with his father, he, you know, and I, I already, already, I'm just summarizing. We've taught this in great detail. If he would have spent fellowship time, just come in from the fields, come in and what, what are you talking about, Gary? Worship, the word, prayer, fasting, fellowship. Spend time with the father. Just get quiet. Be in his presence. Listen. <laughs> He would have been at first stunned. What? Your heart broken over this prodigal of yours while he's wasted your goods and with harlots, you know. And but he, he eventually, if he'd have kept coming and spending time with his father, little by little, the love that's in the father's heart would start getting in his heart, and the day would come that he he would probably say, "Well, listen, father, if if." If you're that heartbroken over your lost son, would you like for me to go looking for him? Would you like for me to go tell him that he that you still love him and want him to return? Seeing right there, our true ministry is born from a heart of love. Faith works by love. Okay. Well, so that summarizes. All right, so let, let's say that the father says, oh, well, that would be great. I want you to go. Yes, that would be wonderful. I will supply you with supply wagons. I will send servants along with you. Uh, uh, yes, anything you need, you just ask me. And yes, go go seek and save the lost, which is, of course, the same mission that Jesus was on. <laughs> We're back to Luke 15, 1 now. But anyway, so in my little teaching parable of this son who has now got the love of the father in him, and he has become a serving son, and he's on the mission to seek and to save the lost. Now listen, this, this applies to everybody in the body of Christ, not just evangelists. There are more than just evangelists in the body. Somebody has to answer the phones, somebody has to do the books, somebody has to sweep the floor, somebody has to teach, somebody has to handle the children, somebody, we have all of these functions. Maybe you're just, I'm just a housewife. I'm just raising godly, I'm doing my best to raise up godly children. Thank God for you. And you're just as much a part of the body of Christ as anybody else. And your overall mission is to seek and save the lost. In your case, you're very specific, but this applies to all of us. So we're all serving sons. I don't care what your job is. We're all seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So we're all out. We're on our mission. So let's get back. So if you can picture in your mind this caravan leaving the father's house and the serving son is in the front and, and uh, there's you know maybe several wagons full of supplies and there's servants and camels and, and, and they're heading out, you know. Well, the thing of it is, he finds out pretty quick there's an enemy out there that's determined to stop him. And, you know, here, let me, let me just, now I, I wrote a few notes here. Let me, let me read this paragraph. So when the serving son sets out on his mission, he, he soon learns there is an enemy <laughs> completely determined to stop him. This enemy caused every sort of problem imaginable. <laughs> I just wrote a few things. You know, like in that example, the camels went lame. <laughs> the wheels on the wagon started coming off. There was arguing and strife among the servants. There were attacks against the supply wagons, <laughs> you <know>, thieves. <laughs> then there was sickness that invaded the camp. And, and all of these attacks, they're all intended for one thing, to cause discouragement, to wear out the serving son, to get him to the point. The goal was to get the serving son to finally just give up and abandon the mission. There's an enemy out there. Have you, have you noticed that? <laughs> So the serving son, in my little story here, my parable, the serving son sent a messenger back to the father. Now, what, what would that be? That's prayer. <laughs> okay. We got trouble. <laughs> the, 
There's an enemy out here. And he starts describing this messenger tells the father about all of these attacks and all these different ways that the enemy is coming against us, trying to stop us. So the father says, I know what I'll do. I've got a helper. His name is the Holy Spirit. I am going to send this helper to be with my serving sons. And let me tell you, everything changed when the helper came on the scene. <laughs> I just wrote a few things here. That the Holy Spirit provided leadership. No more was the elder son, the serving son now. No more was he just left like an orphan to find his own way. Ah, oh, all of a sudden now, he has the leadership that comes from the Holy Spirit who knows everything. He found out the helper would loose the supply wagons. All he had to do was hear and obey. And suddenly the supply was flowing again. Everything that they needed for the mission. He found out that the helper provided counsel. Whenever he did not know what to do, he could turn to this helper. And the helper always brought the counsel of the father. From that, from that day on, he knew what to do. All he had to do was just turn, ask, Get quiet, listen, and obey. He found out that this helper brings power to enforce authority. He found out that he could speak in the name of the Father. He could speak, and the Holy Spirit would bring power to scatter the enemy's troops. <laughs> he found out he, he could just speak against sickness and it would leave. And the people would be healthy again. That every time that he would just speak, the enemy's troops were scattered like the wind. He found out that this helper, through the helper, all things are now possible. All things are possible. Now, what joy it was to the serving son when the Holy Spirit came to him from the Father. Oh, I remember the day. <laughs> he found out he had received power now. Now that the Holy Spirit had come to him. With the power and leadership of the Helper, the Holy Spirit, the mission now continued with great increase and success. But you know, the enemy still did not give up. At first, the enemy was completely dumbfounded as to what to do. What can I do to disrupt this mission to re that, that the serving son is on to rescue the prodigals? This enemy had no power or authority against the Holy Spirit who had come from the Father. He found out quickly this Holy Spirit could not be tempted. He could not be deceived. He could not be bribed. He could not be overpowered. What to do? As long as the serving son stayed in close fellowship with the Holy Spirit, no weapon formed against him could prosper. So the enemy decided he only had one hope, and that's, what, that's the title of today's lesson, the enemy's only hope. This enemy decided I, there's only one hope. Since the Holy Spirit is invisible, I have to convince somehow the serving son that the Holy Spirit has not come to him. The enemy decided his only hope was to get the serving son out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit. From that point on, the enemy focused all of his strategy on breaking the fellowship, the communication between the Holy Spirit and the serving son. If the enemy could somehow break that line of communication, the serving son would be cut off from the power and the provision of the helper that the father had sent. And he'd no longer be doing things in the strength of the Holy Spirit. The serving son from that point on would be trying to do the mission in his own human strength. And in his own human strength, he was no match for the enemy. See, what we all have to learn is what Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6 says. 
Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. I was going to move on, like I said, into the next section of the teaching. But I felt the Holy Spirit said, no, do another lesson and emphasize this truth. He reminded me of something he said to me in the face-to-face -face documents. I hope you're familiar with those. They're also at the website. There's a whole section called face-to-face. This one is in F9809.02. This is an, I'm going to read you an excerpt from it. The title is The Works of the Father. This, are, this is a direct quote. I'm just quoting what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said, If the greatest heart cry of the exalted Son of Man could be heard upon the earth today, it would be this. If what he's talking if, if if we could hear the if, if we could hear the greatest heart cry of Jesus seated at the right hand of God, this is what it would be. Oh, that my brethren, that's us, oh, that my brethren would sit, listen, and hearken to the counsel of my Father's Spirit as He brings my mind to them. End of quote. End of what... For his mind, the mind of Christ, is the will of the Father. His mind, the mind of Christ, is made fully known unto the Spirit of Truth. The Holy Spirit knows what's in the mind of Christ. And the Comforter, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will take of his and show all things unto his brethren. If, there's a big if, they will sit, listen, and hearken as the Holy Spirit brings the voice of Him who speaks from heaven to the earth. Continuing from that face-to-face -face document, The enemy, I hear you asking of me, what is the mindset of Christ Jesus concerning the enemy? Christ Jesus does not consider wars, pestilence, famine, disease, divisions, factions, greed, avarice, witchcraft, murders, and the like to be the finest work of the enemy. He sees all of these things as being byproducts of the enemy's only valid triumph. All of these things are byproducts of the communication being severed between the believer and the mind of Christ. There is no defeat where the mind of Christ is known and acted upon, says the Spirit of Grace. By severing believers from fellowship and communion with the Comforter, the mind of Christ is seldom known. And where the mind of Christ is not known, the will of the Father cannot be performed. Every victory obtained by the enemy stems from a single root. Boy, if you can get this. That root being broken fellowship and lack of communication with the Spirit of Truth, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Helper, who has been sent by the Father and the Son, all tragedy, all defeat, all terror, all division, all works of death stem from this single root, says the Spirit of Grace. And that's the end of that quoting part. See, I've been at this a long time. Lots of prayer requests over the years. I've done so many prayer lines, you know. The most common, well, not the most, but one of the most common requests when people you know what what do you want me to pray for what do you want from god or what's what's your situation now not always but one of the most common 
things is I can't hear God. People say it to me all the time. I, I just can't hear God. See, and the thing of it is, I know what you mean when you say that. I've been there myself. I don't say that anymore. I've learned not to say that, even when it seems like that. <laughs> because you have what you say. See, Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I mean, I have him the way, the truth, the life. Listen, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. Now, at the time he said that, the sheep, let's just take the 12, and there were many more besides the 12, they could, they could talk with Jesus. Jesus, when they said, when they heard him, they were literally hearing the sounds that came from his physical lips. They were hearing with their physical ears. I used to be so jealous of that. I said, this is not fair. <laughs> Peter, James, John, they could, they could just sit around the campfire in the evenings after the teaching was done. They could ask you questions. You, they would ask you anything and you'd, you'd answer them. But they could hear directly from you. <laughs> then it reminded me of Paul, who never had that opportunity to sit around the campfire with the physical Jesus. <clears throat> you know, Paul got saved after Jesus was already glorified and seated at the right hand of the Father. Yet he reminded me that Paul knew Jesus better than Peter. Remember in the book of Galatians where Paul had to correct Peter? <laughs> Paul knew the Lord at that moment better than Peter did, even though Paul never had that opportunity to sit around the campfire. And now he began, so the, Holy, the Lord began asking me when, during my complaining, this is not fair, this is not fair. Peter, James, and John, they could sit around the campfire. They could hear your voice. They could hear your voice with their physical ear. And he said, what about Paul? Paul never had that opportunity, but he came to know me better than they did. He wrote more the New Testament than any of them. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Who was his teacher? I said, well, that had to be the helper, had to be the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul said Jesus himself taught him. Still, it was by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus doesn't literally leave the right hand of God to come here and teach. He teaches, but he teaches by the Holy Spirit. So that let me know that Jesus, when he, he was not kidding way back when he said, it is in the King James, it says, is it, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you, the Holy Spirit. And that word expedient literally means it's better for you. And I thought, it's not better for us. <laughs> And it's sad that we think we know more than Jesus, you know. I, I, but I used to think, it's not better. <laughs> but see, it is better because in order to hear Jesus in their time, when he was physically on the earth, you had to be in his physical presence. So if that was still the case, if he was physically on the earth today and had an office in Jerusalem, you know, uh, and I needed to have an appointment with him, uh, you, you know, you phone his office <laughs> Okay, we're going to give you a number. Your number is 10,427. Let's see, that'll put you on. It'll be here in 37 years. <laughs> that'll, be, that'll be when it's your time to get your question answered, Sig. <laughs> it is better for us that we have the Holy Spirit, that each of us has access to the mind of Christ, and I mean right now, the mind of Christ, by way of the Holy Spirit. It is so much better for us. That's why He has sent us the Holy Spirit, and He intends for us to be in perfect communication with the Lord at all times by way of the Holy Spirit. It is so much better. I don't have to travel to Jerusalem because He has sent the Holy Spirit to me. One time He said to me, He said, you, you have some difficulty getting in my presence, so I have sent the Holy Spirit to be in your presence. <laughs> How, how wise, how smart is our God? But our, our problem, I know, what, when I know what 
people mean when they say, I can't hear God. That was my confession too in the beginning. That's why I always got in the prayer line every time Pastor Dave would have one in the early days. I mean, I don't care if he <laughs> gave, you know, uh, or go, I'm going to have a prayer line for hangnails. I'd get in it anyway. <laughs> I'm just hoping to hear anything from God because I, I had no trust that I could hear God for myself. I trusted that Dave could hear God even for me. And he'd thank God, and God is so good and so gracious. And in those early days, you know, he would just encourage us, and Dave would have words for us from time to time. But I remember the day, I don't remember how long it was. It was, it was a little while, several, two or three years, I don't know. But see, the thing of it is, Sue and I really ran, we started running with the message. We prayed, like, to our, how did Dave say that? I pray so much, I feel like my lips are going to fall off and just roll across the floor, you know. <laughs> just pray, pray, pray. Still had trouble hearing God, you know. But then I remember the day that we were, got in one of those prayer lines again, and the, and the Lord was very gracious to us through Pastor Dave. But this time, Dave says, Oh, oh, I won't be having words for you very often in the future. Because now you've matured to the place you can hear him for yourself. Now, if you if Dave would have stopped right there and asked me, Gary, can you hear him for yourself? I would have said, no. <laughs> that's, that's why I keep getting in this prayer line. <laughs> no, no. But see, the Lord was telling Dave otherwise. He said, no, he is getting to that place where he can hear. See, the thing of it is, there was a song out at, oh, quite a long time ago called Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. To be honest with you, we're looking for his voice in all the wrong places. And for years, I kept making the mistake of lo looking for his voice in my mind, my natural mind. That's not really, I mean, you, you can hear him in your natural mind, I have. In fact, I've heard it so clear, it makes me wonder if you had been there, if you would have heard it, because it almost it seemed like audible. But that's really rare. I can only count maybe twice that I've that I know for sure that it well no three times that I know for sure it's happened like that. The vast majority of the time it's not like that. And so I just kept listening in my mind, you know, like the same way I see when we talk to each other, we literally hear with our ear, but it goes directly into our natural brain. And that's where we're used to hearing people. But if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I didn't look up the verse, but it says real plainly there that the natural man, the, the things of God are foolishness to him, for they are spiritually discerned. The Holy Spirit is a spirit. God is a spirit. And at your core, you are a spirit being. He communicates with us primarily spirit to spirit. And it... The voice of God is more closely aligned with your conscience than with your mind. See, your conscience communicates with you perfectly. Just try and, if you're a Christian, just try and steal something. <laughs> I'm going to steal that. Your conscience, you don't hear a voice. I always say you don't hear Charlton Heston's voice like in, like a, as Moses in the movie, you know, uh, the Ten Commandments. You know, thou shalt not steal. You don't hear it in your natural mind. Boy, that communication, though, from your reborn spirit, you just, th I'm going to steal that. Oh, instant, instant, perfect communication. Nope, not going to steal it either. <laughs> that didn't come from your mind. See, you're, that's, your conscience really is the voice of your human spirit. It is the green light, red light. This is okay. That's not okay. It's the first level of leadership for righteousness when you get born again. My friend Homer, who I just love to pieces, he was a semi gangster, you know. <laughs> I mean, he, you hear him tell his own story. I mean, with guns and drugs and women and all of this and foul mouth and all of this, you know, and I, I, I wasn't. I was just as lost and just as much a sinner, but I was a different kind. <laughs> just as lost. <laughs> but Homer, I love it. He says, I mean, he says, just instantly, within moments, I just, after I received Jesus, 
I knew adultery was wrong, lying was wrong, stealing was wrong, <laughs> my abusive language was wrong. I needed to put a redeposit of love for my wife again in there that wasn't there but the instant before, but now it's there. And see, that that's the new nature. And that's, you know that you know, it's not a voice in your head. It's, it's your, again, it's your spirit. And the voice of your spirit, the first level of that voice is your conscience. So when... We're looking for God's voice in our mental intellect most of the time, and we're not hearing it. Well, it's because it doesn't really come from there. He speaks from your. He speaks to your spirit, and from your spirit. So I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a big clue here. Now. I think most of the people that watch these videos have already been filled with the Holy Ghost to the point you can speak with other tongues. Now listen to me. Listen to me, please. I'll never forget the day he showed me this. If you can speak with other tongues, you definitely can hear God. What? The reason I say that is, Jane, see the ball. It's two plus two equals four. It's undeniable. See, we speak in an unknown tongue as the Spirit, Holy Spirit, gives the utterance. You're not creating those syllables. The Holy Spirit is creating those syllables. And it's impossible for you to speak them without you hearing them. <laughs> it's a instant communication. Now get this. Dave, now listen, I, I did not originate this. All of this is Dave Roberson 101 you go back and listen to all of those wonderful messages at daveroberson.org about uh, listening, learning to discern the voice of God. And all of those. Listen, the Holy Spirit, see, he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. No man understands him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaks in mysteries. The Holy Spirit is teaching you spirit to spirit. He is the one creating those syllables. You're not creating them, yet you're speaking them. How is that possible except your spirit is, okay, there's a transfer. Like, you got a spiritual mind. You're a, you are a spirit being. You remember, okay, I'm, 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 I'm not going to go too fast. Dave would teach us eloquently from the rich man and Lazarus. That rich man, you know where he wound up? He wound up in hell. Well, his spirit is in his body. It plainly tells you it was buried in the grave. But his spirit man went to hell. and his, So his spirit, he still had his memories. He knew he had brothers. He knew who Lazarus was. He knew who Abraham was. He was surprised that he wound up in hell. But remember, he said he could see Lazarus. So what does that tell you? Your spirit man, now his body's in the grave. His spirit man has eyes. He says... Please, he said, have Lazarus dip his finger in water and touch my tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. Now, what does that tell you? All right, we already know he had eyes because he could see Lazarus. We know he asked for Lazarus to dip his finger into water, so your spirit man has tips of fingers, is how Dave would say it. And we know that the spirit man has a tongue because he asked him, he says, ask Lazarus to dip his finger. Well, that's his spiritual finger and touch my tongue. That's a spiritual tongue. There is a spiritual body. So Dave would say, listen, if we have, if our spirit man has eyes and our spirit man has tips of fingers and our spirit man has a tongue, don't you know our spirit man has all the other parts of the body too? Hmm. That means you have a spiritual mind that's inside your natural brain. You have a spiritual mind. And that's the part of you that the Holy Spirit communicates with. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that it is to spiritually discerned. Now, learning to locate that place in you takes some practice, takes some time. I want to recommend to you again, like I've done so many times before, Dave's little two-message series entitled, 
distinguishing God's voice. Distinguishing God's voice. Dear Lord, I wore those two messages out. <laughs> and then I wore me out, putting them into practice for days and in weeks and in months until I learned to distinguish God's voice. I'm sorry, incoming. <laughs> <laughs> he wants me to go down there. Okay. Yes, sir. He wants, he wants me to encourage you. He did not leave you as an orphan. He did not leave you to have to find your own way. He knows that in our own strength, in our natural humanness, even our born again humanness, we are no match for the enemy. We are no match. That's why he did not leave us as an orphan. Not only has he strengthened you with his own might in your spiritual man by giving us the very nature of Christ, but he sent us the Holy Spirit who also helps us in our infirmities. For the Holy Spirit, he knows the plan of God. He knows the mind of Christ for you. And if you'll allow him to make intercession for you with those groanings that cannot be uttered, he will pray God's perfect plan for your life. And at first you won't even understand what he's praying. And it says our understanding is unfruitful, especially at the beginning. That's because he is communicating with your spiritual mind and not your natural mind. But as you continue to pray, you will discern your spirit will discern what's going on. And once your spirit mind understands what's happening, your natural mind will begin to understand at least what it needs to do in, a pra in practical steps. Let me give you an illustration from yesterday. Sue and I, we've done something really spiritual. Sue likes to shop at the Dollar Tree. <laughs> she just likes those stores. And so... Uh, went with her and because we were going to grab some lunch while we were out and so uh, i went with her and we went to a dollar tree as a new one that she'd never been to before and she didn't like that one so we went to but she bought a few few items paid for them of course with our debit card then we went to another dollar tree and when she got ready to pay at the second dollar tree she couldn't find the debit card and she's looking for it looking for it couldn't find it and we eventually had to pay a, a different way. And, and you know, and she's going, well, I know I had it at the other store. I, and so we, we had the clerks looking. <laughs> Look, maybe it's dropped on the floor. Maybe it went through all of, of course, went through her purse, you know, went through everything. Went through the, every sack. Could not find that card. And, you know, Listen, I've, I've done that same thing. This is just, but it just happened yesterday, and it's so perfect here. Now, just watch what's going on here. Well, uh, we, we pay for it another way. We left our phone number in case of anyone at the store found it, they could call. We go home. I mean, we emptied every sack. <laughs> we emptied her purse out on the floor. We're both looking, looking, looking. And finally... I said, well, there's nothing else to do. I'm just going to have to call the bank and cancel that card. Uh, apparently, we dropped it. You know, and I've done this same thing, and you, you probably had to. Anyway, <laughs> or lost something you know, that you couldn't find. And, of course, I'm listening. I'm always in the habit of listening as, as, as close, you know, trying to listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. I've trained myself over the years to do it, but I wasn't hearing anything. And, and, uh, but I probably was making that same mistake, looking for God and His voice in all the wrong places. Oh, God, just talk to me, you know, when He can. But anyway, so I called the bank. I'm I'm waiting, you know, when you had is when you call your online banking, they put you on hold for eternity plus three days. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And suddenly, it's in, and it's in that place through practice long times of practice the same place in me that I've grown accustomed where the little teaching visions occur where like in a prayer line uh, I talk about the pictures that come to help help me minister to people 
uh, sometimes illustrations. It's just that place in me where the Holy Spirit talks. Because listen, it's not always words. More often now in my life, it's pictures. and, and uh, But it can be words. And it's hard to describe. But suddenly, I'm, I'm waiting online. And just before the operator actually comes on the line, suddenly, I see a pocket. And I said, Sue, because she'd already changed her clothes after we'd come in. I said, Sue, the pants you had on, did they have pockets? She went, yes, but I never, I never use them. I said, go check. I'm still got to, now, while she's gone to check, the operator comes on the line. <laughs> and I'm going, hello, my name's Gary Carpenter. Uh, we've lost, uh, we can't find one of our debit. And about that time, Sue walks in holding the debit card. <laughs> Sue walks in holding. I said, never mind, we found it. And she, the operator just started laughing. Okay, well, I'm glad for you. <laughs> okay. There it was. Now, the Holy Spirit knew that the whole time. To my shame, it, it's, I, I'm going to, I'm always, it seems like I'm always a very transparent. <laughs> to my shame, I was listening but I did not directly ask the Holy Spirit, my helper, <laughs> would you show me where that is? Obvi the more Sue thought about it, she said, oh, I know what happened. I was just about ready to, to pay. And then I thought, oh, I need one of those. And I, I obviously slipped that card in my pocket and went over there. And, and, but I was over there a while. By the time I came back, I just forgot that I put that card in my pocket. I never use my pockets. Men use pockets. Women usually don't too much. <laughs> it just it could happen. to I've done similar things myself. But see, I didn't really just ask. And this is the big problem. See, you say, oh, that's, oh, that's no big thing. And, you, know, you just call and cancel your debit card. Let me ask you, gospel entrepreneur, for example, what if that was a $4 billion transaction? Not, not the debit card. What if you're in the middle of a four billion dollar transaction, and you need a you need information, something from the Holy Ghost? How critical would it be for you to get that information? See, it's so obvious to me. Just looking at just what happened yesterday, the Holy Spirit knew where that card was the whole time. He's not withholding information from me, really. The Holy Spirit knew where that card was the whole time. He is not withholding information from me at all. He is more more than he is sent for the very purpose to bring me the mind of Christ in every situation that I have. But was my first thought turn to him and ask, oh, Holy Spirit, please show me where that is." No. Nope. Sadly. <laughs> From the time that the card was till the time we knew we had a problem till the time that we that he that I saw the little thing the pocket check the pocket probably three hours maybe went by and I don't re I know I didn't actually ask Lord would you show me where that is <laughs> now I was listening because I I've, I'm, I've I've trained myself to always have that door open. But I think I would have got the answer immediately if I just would have asked. Now, the point is this. <laughs> I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been at this. We've got to continually humble ourselves, humble ourselves, and humble ourselves. And I'm thinking about the blueprint prophecies right now and how often the Holy, how often we're told, spend time with me intimacy is the order of the day come into my presence spend time with me and he means in every way in worship and in, in uh, the word and prayer and fasting in every way why he wants us to become so attuned is that a good word attuned <laughs> you accustomed to his presence that the first the first thing we think of is turn to our helper See, the enemy's only hope is that he breaks that fellowship. 
The only hope he... I'm, I'm sure those devils were just laughing yesterday. Ha, ha, ha. Gary's not smart enough to turn to the Holy Spirit. Gary hadn't even thought of it. Look at him. Look at him and Sue trying to figure this out on their own. Ha, ha, ha. And they think they can do great things for God. See, it just makes me angry <laughs> when I think about it that way. What I need to do is... Listen, do you know it's really... <laughs> It's really hard to sin, to commit sin, okay? When you're, if you were actually, let me just say it this way. If, if you could physically see Jesus standing right next to you, <laughs> he's right there. And if you could physically see Jesus right there, what kind of sin are you going to go do? <laughs> you're not, because you're, in, you're so aware of his presence, <laughs> You know, well, he's right there. If we can get that way with God, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but not only is it is He the safeguard against sin, but He is our. What, what were those things that I listed? He will loose your supply wagons. <laughs> he He'll provide leadership. He'll loose your supply wagons. He'll bring you counsel for every situation that you're in. When you speak, he will exercise his power to enforce the authority that you have in the name of Jesus. Sickness is not a problem for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> He'll tell us exactly what to say and do, just like in the book of Acts. Listen, when, when the Holy Ghost shows, on the, shows up on the scene, the enemies are scattered. I love how Jesus said, if I cast out devils with the finger of God, with the that's the Holy Ghost. It's like the finger of God. It doesn't take a lot of power. Okay, I got this demon-possessed, terrible, looks horrible from a human perspective. And all it takes is flip, the finger of God. Flip. <laughs> devil's gone, see? <laughs> the Holy Spirit, that the, He is the helper that the Father has sent us the serving sons and more more than ever I, yes sir I remember another time in my life now this is many years ago many years ago he'll help you with everything one of our daughters uh, was supposed to be at a certain place not at our house and I'm just sit sitting at home this happened on two different occasions one time I wound up walking another time I drove but I began hearing I, he didn't tell me that it was concerning her. I just, in my spirit, I began to discern, get in the car, drive down this street, turn right here, turn left here, turn right there. I went to a house I've never been to in my life, pull in the driveway, knock on the door. Who answers the door but my daughter? And she's not supposed to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Another, there was another another time, same kind of thing, and I wound up following those same kind of directions. I pulled into a parking spot. I didn't know she was in the pickup parked right next to me. I couldn't see her in that pickup, but she sure saw me. <laughs> she said she slumped down in the seat. I don't know what the enemy had planned for her that night, but he just directed me to pull in that parking spot where she could see me, and it disrupted the whole plan. He is our helper. He is our counselor he, in every way. But we've got... No wonder he keeps calling for intimacy in this hour. This revival is going to be unlike any revival in the history of man. He himself has called it a presence. His very presence revival. We have got to learn how to follow him. This helper that he has sent us is a helper beyond words to describe how wonderful and powerful and wonderful in every way that it is. Let me just say it again. You can hear the voice of God. You can hear. You can discern the voice of the Spirit. If you can pray in tongues, you're already hearing him because you cannot pray in tongues without hearing him. He is the one. I'm going to say it again. He is the one creating those syllables. You can't speak them 
unless your spirit is picking it up from the Holy Spirit. That transfer is being made in you already, or you could not speak them. So if you're able to speak in tongues, you're already able to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, so let him pray that he may interpret. Now I know primarily there he's talking about interpret for a, you know, if there's a tongue for a church assembly, pray that you can interpret but listen, you can pray for understanding. You can pray for understanding also. You can learn that place in you. That just the same way I saw that pocket and it just instantly, it wasn't just seeing the pocket either though. It's just a knowing, hey, hey, the pants you had on, did they have pockets? <laughs> yeah, check the pockets. Sure enough, right there it was. See, Holy Spirit knew it the whole time. We suffered three hours because I didn't ask. I'll just be honest with you. Boy, he loves you guys. Always always having me tell on myself. <laughs> you know, one time, Sue and I, this was years ago, we were looking for a document. I don't even remember now. I think it had something to do with our taxes, trying to get it ready. We needed, whatever it was, we needed that document. We needed it bad. The way our house is made, you go into the garage, there's a door in our dining area. <laughs> and you go through that door into the garage. And we keep a lot of, you know, folders and things, boxes, documents out there too. We had been in and out of that door, I don't know how many times, we've been looking for that document all day. And finally, we, finally, you know, it came to prayer. <laughs> Has it come to that? <laughs> we didn't know what. <laughs> Sadly, it's our last resort when it should be our first resort. <laughs> so finally we said, Father, please help us find this document. Hey, send some angels or something. Get it out where we can see it. Now listen, the next time we open the door to go into the garage to look again, like we'd already been through that door how many times, the next time we opened the door, we would have had to step on that document. It was laying on the floor right there. I mean, you'd have to step on it. Was it there before? I don't think so. I think I would have seen it. <laughs> Oh, now you're talking angels involved. Well, it, the Bible says they're all ministering spirits sent forth to help these heirs of salvation. He's called the Lord of hosts. Those hosts are the angel armies. Okay. I'm just, he wants a reminder today. I want to read that one part again. The only hope that the enemy has. See, with the new nature and equipped filled with the Holy Ghost, the enemy is under your feet. He has no hope. I want to say it again. The, the, Holy, he, the, the enemy found out real quick that the Holy Spirit could not be tempted, could not be deceived, could not be bribed, could not be overpowered. What, what can he do? What is the only hope? The enemy decided he only had one hope. Since the Holy Spirit is invisible, the enemy has to somehow convince the serving sons, the children of God, that the Holy Spirit has not really come to them. His only hope was to get the serving son out of fellowship, excuse me, out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit. From that point on, the enemy focused all of his strategy on breaking the fellowship, the communion between the serving son and the Holy Spirit. If the enemy could somehow break that line of communication, the serving son would be cut off from the power and provision of the Father and would be left to continue the mission in his own strength. And in our own strength, we are no match for the enemy. Remember what he said to Zerubbabel. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You are able to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye for now.